you know, perform action for the sake of action. You know, perform your duty for the sake of action. Find joy in action. Leave the results for something else. We do not perform this for the sake of fruits of action. And so it goes, verse by verse, verse after verse. I'd like to make sure that I understand what, what you meant. When you, when you said that, um, I'm not sure exactly the words, but it happens, it costs us something. Like experiencing the world and all the amazing experiences, um, all the loudness, and the attractiveness of life, it has some expenses, it costs us something. And I find it interesting that one, one reason why I decided to, to come here today had to do with the perception of how fast my life is, how I am jumping from one point to another, to another, to another, and my thoughts are already 10 kilometers forward and I'm not here. And I was wondering if it's this yearning for what is on the background, this yearning, this voice, this silent voice that, that tells me, yeah, life is all about experiences, but actually there is something else going on. which is the reason why I'm here. And not only here, but in this planet. Well, the, another way, maybe even more direct way of putting it, that um, us is the cost what you put in your question as this, you know, us in the first place, this experience of me is already, already, is the greatest cost. So, that what gives this experience of me, that in itself is the greatest of all the cost, this is what it costs to your awareness. You see? In that um, poetic language of the ancients and that poetic language of the mystics, so-called mystics, the poets, mystics, it's like the whole ocean arrested in a drop, that expression. What power must be in that drop to arrest the entire ocean. So the cost is already that. That sense of me is the greatest of all the costs. Each and every one of us is a living example of that. Each and every one is an example of that. So there are ways of how this could be responded to what you have brought out into the open. But first, this is a primal understanding. The primal understanding of what is taking place. So it's not that life is somehow, life, experience, all this multiplicity, which could also be spoken in that way. All this multiplicity, all this diversity is at the cost. All this diversity, multiplicity, exuberance, this expression is at the cost. And the cost is that, you see? But the greatest of all is that sense of me. That's where awareness is sacrificing itself to such magnanimous degree that then it forgoes the entirety of what it is. When that sacrifice is done, then 
there is already everything set in motion. The propelling forces are there, constantly swelling us with desires to bring the completion to the sense of being incomplete. Because this sense of sacrifice leaves the echo. Because that lingering memory is still there. The lingering memory of wholeness is still there. So in that grand sacrifice that gives this possibility of me, that sense of individual I rising and standing seemingly on its own, is then ridden with all this, what well, then it has to, has to go about constantly having to fulfill itself. Because it will never be enough for what it is. This is a perennial teaching. This is the perennial wisdom. Perennial, it's called perennial because it is not subject to time. It's not more important now than it was thousand years ago. It maybe have some additional layers that us feel and we can take the language and we can bring this, spice it up. Oh, wait, wait a minute, we're about to, you know, abdicate ourselves. We're about to incinerate. We're about to, you know, wipe life as we know it off the face of the planet. So it may have these additional layers, but existentially speaking, it's as acute and as accurate as ever. So this sense of constantly going after something with the sense of having to express oneself can be seen also as the very result of knowing deep down that one is utterly and entirely fullness, completeness itself. But it's just taking another route at it. It's taking another, let's say, path towards it. And the path goes through the outer, man outer manifestation. So, of course, we don't want to now throw the baby with the bathtub water. We don't want to also de somehow degrade the experience of being alive. No, contrary to that. We need to really tread carefully and attentively here so that we understand that where that very f fine balance is that fine balance between what actually brings sense of fulfillment from where that sense of fulfillment proceeds even as we still will be forced beyond our capacity to put tap on it towards that what is simply called achieving something in this life leaving a mark leaving an imprint. Somehow, I've been here. Like, somehow, like, you know, cutting it with a knife on the bench I sat, or on a tree, or on a rock. Right? It, less so evident than this, but the way I grew up, it's everywhere. You go to the wildest of places, suddenly you think like, oh my God, Mother Nature as it is, virginal and everything, only to see on the wall, you know, Katya plus Sasha, equals love forever, you know? And there are 100 more of these kind of revelations there. Scraped and scraped, cut into the rock, you know? Not done by the Neolithic people. No, those were different kinds. They, they were also cutting things into the rock, but with a different purpose. So this is something, it's an analogy. Many of us go after and really pursuing something. Some of it can be seen as this and that. Some of this can be scoffed at, belittled. Some of it can be envied. Some of this can be seen as, well, you know, good for them. But summarizing, we need to understand the difference between the Neolithic people doing something on the rocks for posterity, or maybe just for one single hand. And that couple that went there for uh, a weekend, you know, and cutting their names on the rocks for posterity, 
to immortalize the current affair. Because by the time that whole inscription, you know, kind of like, they're probably not together. So that whole equation plus equals has its own arithmetics. There's always this attempt to equate. There's always this algorithm at work. There's always this somehow adding into. There's always this computation. And all this is why? Because it tries to compensate. It tries to compensate, and this is what I'm alluding to, it's because we're programmed already at a given. The greatest sacrifice took place. How can that sacrifice can be appeased? What would be the price? What would be the price? What's the price? Who is the greatest man out there who paid that price? The greatest woman. Did anyone square that affair convincingly enough? You see? I am for one to walk this attentively with you without pretending that I know the answer. I'm only tentatively stumbling. Maybe there is somewhere, some, somehow. I don't know. I don't know. There are moments when we hear a lot of, a lot of sounds, a lot of music, you know? It's accompanying us on a daily basis. And there are moments when nothing less will do than that. That, you know, like it has to be, whatever that is, whatever that your choice, whatever that your preference, whatever that is, moves the deepest dimension of your being. Where whatever that finds the deepest resonance with the innermost chamber within your heart. It could be just like a, a song that you've heard as a child. I don't know. It could be one particular performance, one particular movement from Mozart's Requiem. I'm, part, you know, confessing I'm a sucker. Once a year, got to be something from Requiem. And we're coming to that time. It's just like, you know, you don't listen to Requiem in the heat of the summer. No. You don't, you know, there has to be something that reminds us about the mortality of this whole event. There has to be an element of that tantric smashan, a sacrificial pyre. There has to be something. You know, there has to have this element of this all after, ultimately speaking, is nothing but ashes. So, I don't know. Is that, was all these, all these expressions, attempts at fulfilling the incompleteness? See? I don't want to turn this now into a clinical discourse of do's and don'ts. Something is being spoken. Something is being heard. You know what that is at the end of the day. The more I sit in this chair, uh, a similar one, the more I realize that nothing can be conveyed until one is actually hears. And hearing is not even through the ears. But job needs to be done. So I'm here. See? Where are you going? Where everyone is going? What are we driven by? What is our motivation? You know, sometimes it's very, very healthy to be stopped in our tracks because it's better if we have that capacity because sometimes that stop in the tracks could be something which is much more arresting. You know, it just brings a hold on the whole thing. And even then, I think not until that it is born within that very, very self-referral after all.
because it's all self-referral. When it wants to really question it, and when it begins to question, it begins to question it all. And no answer would, would do until all the questions are resolved, simply resolved deep within. So that, when that takes place, then there's no longer going after anything. See? That things just take place, naturally unfold. We do what we have to do. See? So that yoga, maybe of action, is beautifully summarized, at least in some of the songs of the divine, in ways that are spoken of simply that, you know, perform action for the sake of action. You know, perform your duty for the sake of action. Find joy in action. Leave the results for something else. We do not perform this for the sake of fruits of action. And so it goes, verse by verse, verse after verse. The Bhagavad Gita, this Gita, that Gita, all these songs are there in the recesses of our being, deep there, resonating. So it takes it takes some clarity to realize what, what really can give some sort of lasting sense of contentment when no longer we are torn by that propensity because no achievement no completion of something can ever bring the completion of the self which is never fragmented um when i hear you now it comes this Im image in my mind I, I see myself like a hamster running in the cage in the wheel running 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 um deep within it's actually empty still there is a sense of it cannot be that yes well there's you know the whole teachings are utilizing that same metaphor the samsara that the wheel samsara you know hamster or squirrel running in a wheel or samsara there's this wheel like this repetition something the propensity some that sense of that which I remember how fittingly it was addressed by Paramahamsa Yogananda in his famous autobiography, right? A canonical text for so many seekers. Nauseating sense, nauseating sense, that sense of knowing that you've experienced that and been brought to experience it again. Like, and this is many, many seekers many sincere finders know that feeling it can come to one in a midst of action or in meditation in a dream somehow not just been there been there done that but also as yogananda here said it accompanied by sense of nausea it, it just like you want out of that and until that happens, we are in that propensity. It, that's the way things are. So that's what maybe makes the world go round, who knows. But recognizing that is the greatest blessing, providing it is accompanied by something that is required to bring that necessary move towards, well, actually, I'm the one who is here calling the shots. I'm the one who is going capable of making changes. I'm the one who is going to cut that chain of repeated experiences. It is up to me, no one else. I may ask for some strength, I may ask for some grace, I may ask for... But it is within. And then it's granted.